Kia ora koutou and welcome everyone to our webinar on uh, adapting to sea level rise for Teddington and Charteris Bay. My name is Crystal Anderson, I'm an engagement advisor here at Council and your host for this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us online tonight. Um, so we'll start by covering some background on the program and what work has been done to date. We'll then move into some detail about the draft adaptation pathways for Tennington and then to Charteris Bay. Um, we'll pause at the end of each section for, for questions. So when you've got those, please just pop them into the meeting chat. So tonight, uh, sorry, I'll introduce you to the team behind the screen and then I'll let you know how you can participate during this session. Um, and then I'll hand over to our presenters to, to start the session. Tonight, you'll be hearing from Tom, who is our Principal Advisor of Coastal Adaptation, and from Ruby, who is a Senior Adaptation Advisor, uh, Jane, who's the Team Leader of Coastal Adaptation, and then we also have Andrew online, who is a Traffic Engineer and a member of the uh, Strategic and Technical Advisory Group that supports the Coastal Panel. He'll jump online later to help us with some questions. So your mics and cameras are switched off to help us keep the session moving, but you can ask questions in the Microsoft Teams chat, which is located at the top bar menu as a speech bubble. If you're not able to use this feature, you can email your questions to us at let's talk at ccc.gobt.nz. If you're hard of hearing or you're experiencing sound issues, you can turn on live captions. Just click the three small dots above the more at the top of your team screen and then click turn on live captions down the bottom of the drop down list. One last thing from me, hopefully the banner came up to let you know that the session is being recorded. This recording will be shared on our YouTube channel in the next few days and you'll receive a link via email showing you how to access this recording. I'll now hand you over to Ruby to start the presentation. Oh, kia ora koutou everyone. Um, a big thank you from me and the rest of the team for uh, taking time out of your night to join us uh, here. Hopefully you find it informative and use it as an opportunity to ask us any questions that you've got before you um, provide your feedback and make a submission online. Um, I am going to kick us off with a bit of an overview of our program and give you some upfront context before I pass over to the rest of our team. So we know that as the climate is warming, sea levels are rising. And this means that hazards like coastal flooding, coastal erosion and rising groundwater are more likely to impact our low-lying inland communities and coastal communities. And this is particularly uh, a problem where there are things or people or places that we care about that are in the way or at risk. Council is going through a process of identifying these risks right across the district and we're, we'll be working with communities to proactively plan for how we can uh, adapt and mitigate these risks over the next 100 years, so quite a long time frame. Get Crystal to flip to the next slide. Cool. Uh, so the Ministry for the Environment has provided councils with guidance on how to undertake this kind of adaptation planning. We took that guidance and we have set out how we are going to adapt it to fit our unique context here in Christchurch and what we call the Coastal Adaptation Framework. So that's the wee little snapshot on the left hand side of your screen. Um, among other things, this framework sets out seven guiding principles, including the decision to focus public funds on public assets. Um, I'm not going to go into that in any more detail now, but if you are interested and you do want to read more about it, then you can find it on our website. And Crystal's just put the link in the chat. Um, adaptation planning, I mean, the key takeaway from it is that adaptation planning is really designed to be a co-creation um, approach between councils and community members. Uh, so to make this achievable, we split up the district into different areas and made the decision to focus our planning in the first instance in what we call the uh, Whakaro Port Littleton Harbour to Kokorata Port Levy Adaptation Area. We also pulled together a coastal panel um, that, that would undertake or take a deep dive into the nitty gritty of this work with us on behalf of the wider community. Um, so the coastal panel is a diverse group of community members. We've got uh, two representatives from both Te Hapu o Natifiki and Te Runanga o, o Kokorarata. Uh, we also have youth, uh, business interests. We've got a representative of the Water Zone Committee, the uh, local community board, and a couple of wider city representatives that sit there as well. 
Coastal Panel is also supported by a specialist and technical advisory group, and so um, they bring a whole range of expertise to the table. We've got council asset managers that sit alongside coastal scientists, representatives from DOC, public health and economists, and you kind of get the picture. Um, one of the first things that the Coastal Panel did supported by the STAG was identify or look at how people and places and things across the harbour would be impacted within the next 30 years, impacted by coastal hazards within the next 30 years. Uh, and this was important um, for us because we know that we can't plan for every inch of our coastline all at once. So we needed um, to go through a process to identify where we needed to focus our attention in the first instance. So. The coastal panel identified uh, six, what we call priority adaptation locations. I probably should uh, fix that on the slide. Uh, and those are listed there on the screen and they showed up on the, the yellow dots there as well. And um, obviously Charteris Bay and Teddington are two of those and they're the ones that we're gonna be focusing on tonight. I'll get to the next slide. Cool. So the timeline across the top really summarises a huge amount of, of work quite simplistically, but the, the key takeaway really is that uh, this isn't the first conversation that we've had with you, and it's certainly not going to be the last. Um, late last year, you told us what it was that you value about living in your community or within the area and the assets that matter most to you. The Coastal Panel took these values and turned them into community objectives that they've used to help guide the drafting of adaptation pathways over about the last year. The panel's now at a point in the process where they're really keen to share these pathways with you, really to make sure that we're all on the right track, um, we're heading down the uh, in the right direction before we spend any more time or resources or money into shaping these options up any further. Your feedback um, throughout this process is really important um, and it is going to help the coastal panel identify preferred pathways that we're going to be back to test with you next year before they go to council for a decision. Down the bottom of the page is an example of what an adaptation pathway might look like. We call these kind of um, these graphs like metro map kind of diagrams and they're not always the easiest to understand. So. Before we go any further, I'm going to pass you over to Tom, who's going to run you through some of the key things that you should know about how to interpret and understand these graphs. Oh, well, thank you, Ruby. Um, yeah, I'll get Crystal to start the video up, but um, as Ruby has mentioned there, you'll see these pathway maps and a lot of our material online for each of our different priority adaptation locations. So tonight we'll focus on these pathways in Teddington and Charteris Bay. So the first thing to sort of highlight here is that the pathways um, exist over that sort of 100 year time frame, as, as is indicated by this black line on the image now. And I'll get Crystal to just sort of play the video through a little bit. So what's sort of shown here by this gray line, um, so this pathway particularly is in relation to a coastal road um, I'll just get just bit there. Yeah, so this pathway is in relation to a uh, coastal road, and what this is essentially showing is the length of the grey line is how long the current approach might reasonably sort of function or work for. So in this case, this example road would function for about sort of 20 odd years, as, as is shown by um, the distance of that um, grey line before you reach a point when you need to move to another option. And we've been able to test um, the sort of performance of these different options using our coastal hazard assessment and various other sort of um, expertise from our specialist and technical advisory group. I'll get Crystal to play out a bit, fair bit more of the video just till the next two lines are up, Crystal. Yeah, that's good. Um, so what we then see in this case is that there's then a choice um, for this road to either flood proof and raise, so sort of protect the road on its existing in its existing location, or as shown by the bottom line, um, potentially remove that road and relocate it to a more landward location. So um, this is just to sort of give an indication of the sort of optionality or choices that might be available. And I'll get you to play through to the end of this video now, Crystal. Um, so the next bit that we wanted to 
include in these pathways is because there's a fair bit of uncertainty in terms of the rate of future sea level rise and the timing of future storm impacts that will impact and damage our assets, we want to establish um, what we call these signals, triggers and thresholds, or, which are different conditions that Council and other groups could monitor to help inform um, a sort of transition or change from one option to another. So rather than saying that we will we will build a new road or move a road in 50 years and just sort of guess at the impacts that might result over that time frame. Instead, we look to establish a set of sort of factors or conditions that we would monitor um, to help inform um, a choice to, to change option at different time frames. So that's sort of what's shown on this pathway and I'll we'll touch on a few more examples a bit later in the session, but you can go to the next slide now, Crystal. Um, so what we want to sort of touch on here is when the coastal panel have been thinking about the different options to include in these adaptation pathways, we draw on the sort of full suite of options. So we're not just thinking about, you know, one or two options. We've got this thing called our um, catalogue of coastal hazard adaptation options, which is on our uh, web page. Essentially, it has these different classes of options from maintain, accommodate, protect. Um, all the way through to retreat and avoid. And essentially the coastal panel has gone through a process with the specialist and technical advisory group to consider each of these different options in the context of our different priority adaptation locations. Um, and that's helped us sort of arrive at some um, suitable options and pathways for each of the different uh, sites or locations. Um, what I'll do now is I'll pass to Jane to talk a bit about um, the private property um, stuff. And yeah, I'll pass to Jane now. Well, kia ora koutou. Um, Ruby previously mentioned that we have a coastal adaptation framework, which essentially is the policy approach that we're taking to adaptation planning. And the council has approved in that framework this um, focus on public assets that you can see to the left hand side there. Essentially what we're saying is that while we'll look at the risk to, to the whole community, we'll be focusing any public funds on um, the adaptation of public assets because they are so intrinsic to communities into the future and that private asset owners are responsible for um, managing the risks to their own assets. Having said that, of course, we really understand that, you know, anyone who has a house in an at-risk area um, may be becoming increasingly concerned about the impact of climate risks, including coastal hazards. So what we've done is we have um, essentially written to uh, around about 100 households across the Littleton Harbour, Whakaropo area, um, where we know that that risk is, is likely to occur within the next 20 odd years. 25 odd years um, and we've provided them with some information about what we know about the risk to their properties so they've got that information that's really tailored for them. Um, we've also got a fact sheet that we've put onto our website so um, that's available as well um, for anyone who wants to find out a little bit more about what opportunities there are for private property owners to I guess increase the resilience or manage the risk to their own properties. Ultimately though and I see Crystal has just put the link up to that, um, ultimately though um, this is a really big issue that's facing the country, in fact, the world. Um, and so the last government had started to propose some legislation to establish a system for um, funding adaptation and also for providing compensation to private property owners who may need to undertake a, a retreat from a hazard um, in their area. That government, the government, uh, the last government didn't quite get that legislation into, um, into the, the house but they did refer it to the Select Committee, the Environment Select Committee, who launched an inquiry into community-led retreat, which is what the government was calling this piece of work. Um, Christchurch City Council put a submission in, and essentially we were very clear that we want to see um, a, a sense of urgency around providing private property owners with an understanding of what they would be able to do if there was a retreat situation, and in terms of compensation, what they'd be able to access. So um, we're very much advocating for um, a faster response to private property owners who may be concerned about this from central government. Um, so 
we've obviously we're obviously looking at a change of government at the moment, and it may be um, a few weeks or perhaps months before we get a sense of clarity about when we might see some further progress on that legislation, and if not that, what the new government proposes to do. So we're just in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment, um, but we'll continue to. Um, advocate for private property owners as well as we're having those communications with the central government. And I'm now going to pass on to Tom, I think. Thanks everyone um, for the start of the presentation. Um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of background on um, the program that the team here has been working on with the Coastal Panel. Um, so we've now got some time to cover off any questions that you might have so far. So if you do have one, please feel free to pop it in the chat now. Um, if you're not able to use the chat function, you can email it through to us at uh, let's talk at ccc.gov2.nz. Um, I will give you a, a minute to, to pop those in, and if we've got no questions, then we will uh, move on to the next section. Great, so we've had a couple of questions popped in the chat, um, so I will direct these towards Jane. Um, so first off, we've got a question from Joan, which, uh, which is, um, what about property owners who have affected land but no houses? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when the government established its inquiry, it published a report from a working group, um, and it was a working group that had um, council representation and sure as a range of other people on it. And what they had put forward was a proposed um, compensation approach. And that compensation approach essentially said that for people who are homeowners and live in their dwelling, they were proposing around about 80 to 90% um, of RV would be paid out as compensation. If somebody was a landlord, um, they would also be eligible for that same level of compensation if they committed to building their rebuilding their rental property elsewhere and keeping it as a rental property. Um, what was put up for holiday homeowners was there would be no compensation, but there would be costs for demolition. Um, and there was no category included for people who had land only. These were ideas that were floated by a working group um, to the last government. So I'm, I'm not suggesting this is what will happen in the future. Um, but at the moment, uh, that's really the only advice we have to work on in terms of answering that question. Thanks, Jane. Um, I'll get you to stay online for the next one as well. Um, this one's from David, and he's asked, has the um, information the council has sent property owners on the risks council is aware of been updated on those properties' limbs? No. Um, we undertook an update of limbs at the end of last year um, to reflect the information we got off the coastal hazards assessment, uh, which we completed in 2021. The letters we wrote to property owners were, were personal communications between council and those individual property owners, and they have not gone on to the limbs. Cool. Thank you, Jane. Um, I might get Tom to jump on for the next question um, from Ian, which is around um, what evidence um, does council have that sea level has risen by 10 centimetres in the past 15 years, um, and any changes that weren't brought on by the earthquake of subsiding land? Sure. Yeah, well, I see both Ian and Neil's questions are somewhat connected, so I'm happy to sort of answer them together. Um, sort of specifically on Ian's question in regards to the sea level rise. Um, so we use information from Littleton Port, which is one of New Zealand's longest standing sea level records. We also sort of validate and look at the record at um, Sumner Head. So both Niwa and Lynn's hold sea level information from a gauge at that site as well. Um, in terms of um, the confidence in those um, 
those rates of sea level rise or that amount of sea level rise in recent years not being attributed to the earthquake or subsiding land. Um, the Littleton Port gauge is corrected for um, local land movement, so the relative um, sea level rise, which Neil has alluded to there. So essentially, um, a group has come together and identified that exact issue, which is sometimes sea level recorders are not always static and they move up and down, and the record has been um, corrected against that, um, that issue. Um, so the information that we have shared is local relative sea level rise, which includes um, any sort of recent local land motion that might have been induced by the Canterbury earthquake. In terms of how tectonic factors affect the proposed relative rate of sea level rise, um, there is a, um, a good web page that I could direct you towards, which is publicly available, the NZ Sea Rise web page, which is a site that you can go to and look at um, the local relative rates of sea level rise in different sections of New Zealand's coastline. So there's two every two kilometres there's a dot and you can click on it and it will tell you the um, the global or sort of um, background sea level rise rate. But then you can also turn on um, vertical land movement, which is that tectonic factor that you've alluded to there, and it will show you the um, the resulting change or the way that um, subsiding or uplifting land might influence that that rate of um, sea level rise. Probably the last thing I'd mention here is that you know, as as many people would know, there was um, large areas of um, liquefaction and associated subsidence in many parts of Christchurch. So um, it would be fair to say that. Um, the sea level rise rate is will locally be accelerated in, in locations where those sorts of conditions have occurred. Yeah, I hope that helps. Cool, thanks very much for that, Tom, and thanks everyone for your questions. Um, so we'll now move on to the section on Teddington. Um, if you've still got a question that you'd like to ask, just pop it in the chat because we will pause again for questions after the Teddington section and then again um, at the end of the session. So um, make sure you keep flicking those through. Um, if you're waiting for the section on Charteris Bay, feel free to pop away for a cuppa um, and pop back here in about 15 minutes or so, um, and we should be on to the Charteris Bay section. So I'll hand back to the team now. Well, and it's back to me to start again. Um, I will actually just get Crystal maybe just to jump to the next slide. Um, while she's doing that, I will get started. Um, so I mentioned earlier that late last year we asked each community what it is that they value most about living in their area. Uh, in Teddington, some of the key things that came through that and Claire were how valued the tranquil uh, natural environment and sense of community were. The road is obviously a really key asset in the area and that was talked about by a lot of people um, that mentioned the importance for being able to move around the harbour and access um, uh, assets or, you know, uh, walkways, uh, fishing spots, the swimming uh, opportunities around the harbour as well. Um, we also know that the road is surrounded by um, a really ecologically significant salt marsh. Um, and so that kind of brings us back full circle around to the environmental values that were talked about as well. Um, these are some of the key things that the Coastal Panel has been keeping in mind um, as they have developed up the draft pathways for the road, um, which is the key public asset in this area. And Tom is going to talk to you more about what that pathway might look like. Oh. Um, yeah, so I guess just to give a little bit um, further context on the sort of risks in Teddington, um, as you can see on the left hand side of the screen, what we've got here is a, a map showing the the sort of vulnerability of the road um, to current sea level. So essentially the different colours, the yellow and the orange relate to the depth of um, coastal flooding or the how close um, rising groundwater is to the surface that might damage the road. The sort of key takeaway from this um, is the sort of difference between these two images. So the image on the right is um, the same thing, the vulnerability of the road, but with 80 centimetres of sea level rise, what you can see quite clearly is that a lot of um, sections of road that aren't vulnerable become vulnerable with that increased sea level. 
um, and the areas that are already vulnerable become increasingly vulnerable. So you can see that the depths of flooding um, currently in the one and 100 year coastal storm are around that sort of relatively low, not much more than sort of 40 odd centimetres, um, but with 80 centimetres um, of sea level rise, um, we could have flood depths well in excess of a metre in some sections of this road that would result in um, obviously more impacts on the road itself. Um, if vehicles would drive to drive on it in those conditions, that would be damaging for the road surface and obviously, most importantly, um, closures and potential interruptions to people wanting to access um, either the city or other places via um, Gibby's Pass, for example. Um, so, yeah, that's just a bit about um, the sort of mapping in the area and the sort of picture around, well, it might not appear to be a sort of major issue right now, but increasingly we do expect that this area will be inundated more often. So I'll get Crystal to shift to the next slide and I'll talk a bit about the pathways. Cool. So in Teddington, um, we've just got the one public asset that's being focused on um, through this through the coastal planning and adaptation planning process. What, we've, what we can see in this image is that we've got the grey line being the existing management approach for the road extending to around the sort of um, 30 to 40 year mark. So that's essentially indicating that based on the information we have at hand at the moment, um, our best guess is that we can get a bit of life out of the road and its existing alignment. Um, through relatively low level intervention, um, maintenance and whatnot, um, and maybe some lower level upgrades. Um, but then in time, there will need to be a choice or decision made to um, flood proof and potentially raise sections of the road um, to lift it above the flood zone so that it's not um, flooded, for example, and people can continue to use it, or alternatively to move um, large parts of this road or, or the sort of majority of that road in that floodplain, which is about five and a half kilometres of road um, to a more elevated inland area. Um, what would probably be obvious to many of you that know this place is that it would be challenging um, to do that. Um, the hillsides around the Tennington Flat will have some issues of their own with instability and whatnot, so those risks would need to be, to be managed also. Um, but it certainly um, isn't um, unfeasible. It would just be a, a significant cost, no doubt. So um, one thing I would encourage you, and we will later in the session, is obviously when you go online, we've provided some indicative sort of costings for the various options that are presented in these pathways. So the, the flood proof, the road option one for Teddington is, um, is costed and that's shared um, within the online material. Um, and the same thing for the moving the road inland to, to higher ground, that's also costed. So, um, yeah, probably useful information before giving advice is to ever think about, um, yeah, cost and um, things like that. Um, probably the last thing I would sort of um, want to sort of touch on lightly here that Ruby sort of set the scene for is that um, the choice here around either retaining the road in its existing location or moving it and land is one that's likely um, to have a potentially at least a significant environmental implication. Um, we know that this area is ecologically significant, um, nationally significant mudflats and wildlife for um, birds, um, and increasingly as sea levels rise, um, the mudflat will want to migrate inland and the road in time will become a bit of a barrier to that sort of natural process. So. Um, in time, the road could be more sort of damaging to the environment. So um, that would something that's something that might need to be considered um, in time by council and the community as well. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll pass back to Crystal, and I think she'll give an opportunity for you guys to ask some questions. Thank you. 
Cool. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, I'll get you to put your camera back on, though, because the first one's for you. Um, everyone else, if you've got a question, please pop it into the, the chat now. Um, but we had a question from Anne come through um, that says, with an 80 centimetre sea level rise and one in 100 year storm, do you have a comment on the duration of time that the road would be flooded? Um, is it going to be affected near or at high tide with storm surge? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a really good question and thank you for that. Um, the short answer is we don't know exactly because our flood mapping has um, extent and depth information but doesn't give us um, duration. But what I could tell you just from my sort of experience as a sort of coastal scientist, um, the tide would be a significant control on this, as would obviously the um, duration over which that storm surge um, conditions might persist. So the one in 100 year storm that is shown and is sort of show, uh, driving what's shown on the mapping is a combination of um, essentially a coincidence between storm surge, so low atmospheric air pressure leading to swelling of the ocean and um, you know, waves that wash in through the harbour as well, but also um, elevated tides. So I would expect um, in most cases, at least for lower level flooding, that the tide waters would likely, um, sorry, the flood levels would likely recede um, in combination with the outgoing tide. So um, that might be um, flooding for, you know, we're talking tens of minutes to low numbers of hours in, in the most likely circumstance, but with higher amounts of sea level rise, for example, that duration would increase. Um, the other thing that would influence it is if there was heavy rainfall at the same time, uh, the ability for that water to drain away would be um, very much minimised. Um, and Teddington's obviously not the most free draining sort of location, so um, that could affect it also. But we don't know exactly, but I hope that, that helps a little bit. Um, cool, thanks, Tom. Um, we also had another question come in uh, from Bob uh, around also a one in one hundred year event and uh, an assessment pre CC modelling, um, and is more likely to be a one in ten year with a um, 0.8 metres rise. Are you able to provide any comment yeah, sure. on that, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question, Bob. So the one in 100 year is defined at the point of the coastal hazard assessment being undertaken, so 2021, and it doesn't include a sort of um, a dynamic or shifting um, storm intensity. So the ARIs, those um, one in 100 year events are essentially static. So what we've defined them as now, if you then change to a metre of sea level rise, the one in 100 year event is the same event, but you're right that um, in the future, because of a warming atmosphere, for example, we might see um, increase in certain wind conditions or other sort of climatic or weather related changes that could shift that. So my expectation would be that um, it's well, it's very difficult and costly to understand, analyze, and include that in this kind of assessment. But when the council would undertake a future revision or assess um, revision of this kind of mapping and assessment, that would be the opportunity to um, essentially look back and revise what a one in one hundred year event is, because you're right, they they will change. Cool, thanks, Tom. Um, and we've just had another question come through, um, but it's it's quite lengthy. So, Tom, do you just want to um, give everyone a little bit of information about where we get our information on um, sea level rise rates um, that we use for our planning? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, because I see it as a fuller question, so perhaps that is one we can help with sort of offline or over email. But in terms of the... Um, just where we get it. Um, so obviously IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is the group that produces a lot of the um, projections around um, climate change and related sea level rises. Um, what we do at Council 
well, I guess there's a step in between that. Um, New Zealand's Ministry for the Environment then takes that, localises that assessment and pushes guidance to groups like essentially local government, so to us at Christchurch City Council, um, and then they might also consider advice around what um, some earlier questions were around vertical land movement, for example. We then receive that advice and what it generally comes in is um, a suite of different sort of sea level rise projections that relate to different future emission scenarios. So these are called um, SSPs or shared socioeconomic pathways. Um, essentially, um, that means that, you know, for example, over the next 30 years, we have a projection for a low end amount of sea level rise of, of around 14 centimetres over the next 30 years and a top end one of closer to around 23 centimetres. So what we do at Council is we work with that range, we'll test the different options, look at the different options and risks under those various different scenarios, sort of stress test some of our options and plans and ideas against some of those more extreme or top end scenarios. But as I indicated earlier, the whole point of using these adaptation pathways is we don't make assumptions around what future might eventuate, but rather we recognise that there's some uncertainty in the future projections and rather we try and establish plans that can be nimble um, and um, yeah, essentially take account for the fact that things might turn out differently than than is projected. Um, but yeah, I hope that's helpful. But yeah, again, that's a pretty big question, so we can we can look to provide something offline if it's useful. Also, thanks, Tom. Um, and one more question has just come through, and I'm not sure whether it's something you can provide any um, advice on right now. Um, it. Um, has it's a comment about the uh, worst storm surge for Teddington and Chatteris Bay would be coincided with an easterly. Um, is there any comment that, that we can make on the um, frequency of easterly direction winds and the storms? No, not in particular, sorry. Um, in terms of the, um, you're right that the surge event or sort of swell event might come from the east but also um, places like Charteris is a little bit different in the sense of its orientation so wind waves from the northwest are probably actually the most damaging for that shorefront so I would suggest that depending on where in Charteris Bay you might actually be um, more concerned about some of the local wind waves generated within the harbour but um, yeah again um, yeah I'm not sure exactly as to the sort of um, uh, a sort of wind rose or frequency of the easterly relative to some of the other wind directions. But yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, thanks for the comment, um, Anne. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, right, we'll now move on to the section on Charteris Bay. Um, if you've got other questions about Tennington that you'd like to ask us, you can either pop these in the chat or you can um, email them through to us. And that goes with any questions that you've got um, after tonight as well. Um, just flick them through to that email address and we'll bring that up on the screen later on in the evening so that you've got that. Um, and we're more than happy to answer whatever questions we can to help you in providing your feedback. So I'll now hand back to the team for Charteris Bay. Great. So going back to that conversation that we had about values late last year, some of the key things that came through for Charteris Bay was the importance of access uh, and ensuring that it's possible to move around the harbour and connect to Christchurch City itself. You also talked a lot about um, how much you valued the natural environment and the ways in which you spend your time enjoying it. Um, I think we had just about everything mentioned from um, swimming, kayaking, paddle boarding, boating, yachting, uh, jumping off wharves, golfing. Um, it was really obvious to us that that kind of connection to the environment for recreation was really important um, for those that live out there and the, and the kind of lifestyle that you enjoy. Um, so again, these are some of the things that the Coastal Panel has kept in mind as they've drafted pathways for um, the assets in this area, um, which Tom is going to talk to you more about now. Cool. Um, yeah, so same story as what I've sort of showed for Teddington, but now here over at um, Charteris a little bit. Um, more difficult maybe on this map to unpack the differences, but I'll just sort of talk about 
a bit about that briefly. So probably the first thing I would want to sort of make clear here is those brown or the brown area on the image on the right relates to an area potentially susceptible to coastal erosion. So the different coloured browns relate to the probability of erosion. So the dark brown, I think, is something like 90% um, or more um, probability of erosion. Um, the road is obviously well within that zone, but this erosion projection assumes no um, defence, which obviously we know that section of marine drive that sort of tapers around the cliff or bends around the cliff there is protected. But um, just for the purposes of um, tonight, just want to make clear that obviously that road, um, you know, going forward would need to be um, bolstered in its defences if the if the plan was to retain it in that existing location. Um, probably the other thing that's maybe fairly obvious here is the section of marine drive in the southwestern corner of these images um, is also um, likely to be a real sort of hot spot for um, coastal erosion. If you've, you know, I'm sure all of you have driven along that route and seen how um, narrow the sort of green space between the road and the um, beachfront is, um, and likely increasingly so, increasingly narrow, um, that would also be a spot where um, erosion or loss of that road um, is, you know, is a real sort of risk that we would need to be thinking about. So whether we need to sort of protect that section or consider other kinds of interventions. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll sort of touch on for now. I won't linger on the slide. I'll move on to the next one and sort of talk us through some of the uh, pathway stuff. Cool. Um, yeah, so a bit different to Teddington. Um, in the, at Charteris Bay, we've got uh, three different public assets that we're focusing on. So we've got Marine Drive, obviously the road, um, the underlying water supply and wastewater infrastructure. So if you're unaware, there is um, you know, a pile of pipes underneath the road there um, and the management or protection of that road um, is very much linked to um, the protection of those pipes because if the if the road goes, it's likely the pipes will go go also. Um, so yeah, there's we haven't we have some adaptation pathways for both the road and the pipes, but they're very much sort of connected and linked. So um, I'll focus on the road for tonight. Um, the other one, um, which is um, very well used, local boat ramp. Um, which was at the northern end of the images I showed on the previous slide um, and I understand has been recently upgraded. So um, that's another public asset that we sort of produce a pathway for and that's in the public material as well. Um, so what I want to sort of touch on on this slide is just sort of two sort of broad schools of options for ways that um, these various different assets might be managed and then I'll sort of dive into the specific pathways on the following slide. Um, so we've got these sort of two schools of thinking. So one is this hold the line approach, which is essentially about using interventions of some kind in Charteris Bay. These interventions would likely need to be um, hard defences, so rock walls, sea walls, this sort of defence um, to protect these assets. So in the case of the road, it would likely be um, additional rock armouring, for example, maybe raising of the road to reduce um, overtopping of waves and flooding of the road surface. In the case of the boat ramp, it might be things like, again, rock armour, for example, to protect either side of the ramp, maybe lifting um, sections of the park or ramp up to accommodate rising seas, for example, also. So that's sort of one school of thinking, which is about sort of building our way through the, the problem to some extent and allowing our assets to be retained in the locations that they are. Um, the second one is more about working with nature. So this is about sort of creating space where possible for, for assets, um, oh, sorry, for coastal processes and rising seas and to accommodate those changes by moving assets um, inland to locations that are away from those impacts. So in the case of the road, it would be about finding an alternate route, for example, um, in this case, which would likely require things, potentially things like land purchase, so um, big, big ideas, um, we're aware, um, and, you know, likely a, a long way off, but um, ideas that we want to sort of front foot and socialise early. Um, and then in relation to the boat ramp, um, 
that's likely things um, more like potential closure or removal of the asset longer term. So I'll get Crystal to move to the next slide and I'll sort of touch on the pathways now. Cool. Um, so this top one, we don't have the waste and water supply pipes on this image, but think about the lines essentially very much follow the, the roading ones. So in this case, we've got the Charteris Bay, this grey line going for more like 10 to 15 years, so not nearly as long as, as what was indicated in Teddington. So that essentially reflects the level of risk that we believe that the Charteris Road, um, this um, marine drive, sorry, is, is at relative to Teddington. So essentially it's much close to the shoreline. Erosion is much more of an issue. And there are also those two sections either side of Orton Bradley, which are particularly low lying and flooded um, and from direct sort of wave action as well. So a bit different to the Teddington case where there's a you know a large sort of wetland or um, salt marsh between the road and the and the sea. Um, yeah, so we've got maintain lasting for a while, and then again, there's that choice to um, flood proof or protect um, the road. So in this case at Charteris Bay, it could likely be if you're wanting to retain the marine drive in its current location for, for a long time through large amounts of sea level rise, it's um, you would absolutely need to protect the seaward edge with things like rock armour protection, but also you might need to consider um, lifting the road up. Um, because even if it's protected, um, sea levels, tide levels, waves can overtop these defences and leave a lot of water on them. So it's you know challenging, unsafe, um, and results in increased sort of maintenance costs for the roads as well. Um, and then uh, that bottom sort of moss-coloured line um, on that pathway is sort of move the roads. Um, and Andrew, who's online, might be able to field any questions in relation to this one. But this is essentially about looking at where alternate routes might be for a road to essentially avoid um, the really hazard prone shorefront area. Um, so when we were looking at this, we, we first look um, with our specialist and technical advisory group at existing paper road alignments. So we want to look at, well, does council have any opportunities to establish road routes on existing um, public land um, to avoid some of the um, costs and um, public hassle and other things that come about through um, you know, needing to put a road through a different location that might not be publicly owned. Um, but we also look at well, what other road routes do we have um, in land or nearby that could be um, utilised also. Um, and then what I, I won't sort of talk about this one quite so much, but just moving down to the boat ramp, um, again, a very similar pathway to the one above, essentially indicating that boat ramp, which has recently been upgraded, likely has a period of time over which it could be um, sort of maintained under current management practice, maybe with some low level intervention, um, maybe some additional um, small level of maintenance or renewals of the rock armoring. Um, and then we've got that green line down below, the flood proof and protect the boat ramp. So again, I've sort of described what that might involve. Um, rock armour, maybe raising sections to, um, you know, secure the access longer term, those kinds of interventions. And then the bottom line, um, we haven't, the coastal panel didn't include a sort of relocation option in this case, because we felt if a choice was boat ramps have to be close to the shoreline, right? So by the nature of them um, being so, they're in a hazardous area. So if if the, it was a choice made to retain a boat ramp in Charteris Bay for the long term, it's likely that it should probably be at or where around about where it is already um, rather than being relocated completely. So the bottom line on that pathway, remove or close the boat ramp is, is just recognising the fact that in time it might be increasingly expensive, costly, and maybe environmentally damaging to retain an asset in, a, in an area where sea levels have risen up um, a lot. And um, yeah, it might be difficult to, to do that. So um, that would be a choice that would be available too. Um, but I think that's about all from me. So what I'll do is I will, yeah, I'll hand back to Crystal and give you guys an opportunity to ask any further questions if you have them. But yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks so much for that um, presentation on the Charter of Space stuff. 
Um, I'll give you guys a, a few minutes now just to pop some questions in the chat if you've got any. Um, and remember to, if you can't use the chat function, you can email them through. Cool. It looks like we've got a couple of questions come through. Um, so uh, Tom, Neil has a question around um, whether there's a double standard um, around council allowing armouring on um, our assets, so roads, um, but private property is not being permitted to protect against water frontages. Yeah, um, so I can probably only touch on this to some extent, but what I would say is that essentially both of those situations would be subject to a consenting process. So council still has to go through a process. So if, if our transport team wanted, for example, to um, fund and construct a section of rock armour along a low-lying um, coastal road, um, then they would submit that process, go through the appropriate process of um, mitigating um, effects, um, reducing them there where possible, I would expect that the consenting um, party, which might be in, in this case, probably Environment Canterbury and Christchurch City Council itself, would consider the um, criticality of that road route and some other sort of factors like that, for example, because if it was a regionally significant road route, then um, some environmental sort of degradation or impact might be more um, palatable. But um, that's probably all I could really say. They'd both be subject to a consenting process, but the sort of scale and particular nature of the um, intervention would perhaps impact the sort of consenting outcome. Thanks, Tom. Um, and then Anne has said, um, as sea levels rise um, at the Charteris Bay, boat ramp would surely be a benefit um, as it's currently unusable, unusable at low tide for anything other than a diggy. Did you uh, have any comment on that? Yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, it's actually something that our, our parks team brought up to us too, which is, yeah, you're probably right. Um, when I was talking about it being impacted and being need to raise and raised and things I was thinking well into the future, but um, short term, yeah, you're, you're probably absolutely right that it might even be beneficial and allow it to be used during, yeah, a greater range of the sort of tidal cycle. So, yeah, thanks for that. Cool. Um, we've got a question in from David around, um, has council done work on the probability um, of trigger points being hit um, in multiple locations around Christchurch? Yeah, this is a this is a big one. Um, what I can say is that um, we're obviously starting adaptation planning in Littleton Harbour and Port Levy, as Ruby sort of set out um, before that. So it's one of what are currently defined as seven adaptation areas across the district. We're not yet resourced as a team to sort of deliver that all um, all at once. Um, so we don't have sort of full sense of the sort of trigger points that might be met, but you're certainly right that the kinds of events or situations or circumstances that impact the assets in Whakaraupor will do the same to assets around the district. Um, so our ability to sort of um, intervene in a timely manner and whatnot, um, yeah, it would certainly be a challenge. And we've seen that in the North Island, for example, with the um, cyclones and whatnot. Probably the last thing I would mention is our coastal panel will also um, have a responsibility to work through some process of prioritising some of the pathways that um, they've been developing to sort of determine if various triggers were met at sort of the same time or by the same sort of events, which assets should be sort of potentially prioritised in terms of adaptation and protection or intervention. So, yeah, absolutely take that on board, um, David. And yeah, we're certainly aware of that risk. 
Cool. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a break now, Tom. Um, we've got a question for Andrew. Um, what are the possible routes for relocation of both Charteris Bay and Teddington roads? Okay, hi everyone. Um, there's probably two parts to that question. One is the westernmost end, which is probably one of the um, one of the easier ones to relocate. Should should we have to relocate it, and that and that would be to um, instead of continuing through the cutting and, and down uh, towards the shoreline, would be to actually um, continue the alignment further inland um, around around in the vicinity of. Um, the the tennis club and and golf club and things like that I think from from memory uh, the the other and and that largely avoids the um, the real pinch point which which we can see at the moment with the eroding shorefront the other one is is more problematic um, th there is 20 meters of road corridor on Anderson's Road but it, it is not particularly um, easy easy to utilise and I, I think that was also reflected when we looked at um, say head-to-head -head walkway project there is um, yeah narrow carriageway at the moment um, topography is challenging to say the least um, there's also a number of um, vehicle accesses and um, say informal occupation along the length of Anderson's Road that would that would have to be um, be looked at but yeah there is there is a, on, on paper there is certainly um, sufficient width to to um to, to reroute a, a main road um although it, it, i think it'd be fair to say um that that running what one option there'd be other options that would be looked at probably in in preference to that but it's um yeah still early days um i think the main value of something like anderson's road is actually is a perhaps an emergency route um if in the in the short to medium term um, marine drive happens to be closed is, is that Anderson's Road is available to to be utilised in, in those times. Cool, thanks. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, I think Tom just had a follow up comment as well. Yeah. Yeah, so one thing I guess I want to mention that we've been maybe a little bit light on, but there'll be some really good material on our web page uh, in the coming sort of week or so in relation to this is that obviously um, managing the road as a sort of network is a really important idea that we've been thinking about a lot and the coastal panel's been working on. So um, obviously if the road's out at Teddington, it doesn't much matter a whole lot if Marine drives in sort of good nick. Um, so essentially what I'm getting at here is that um, managing that sort of network as a collective um, will be really important going forward and other things, some other ideas that we've been thinking about are some um, ideas around the significant, um, oh sorry, the importance of some of our marine infrastructure, so boat ramps and the Diamond Harbour um, jetty wharf for example um, that provides access over water so in the future um, there could be situations where it's extremely difficult to retain all of the road routes in their existing locations and in time it might be logical to have a more robust um, ferry service for example that sort of provides um, for a more sort of resilient um, access sort of system um, that doesn't necessarily depend on all these discrete sections of road that might be you know damaged or, or impacted by various um, coastal hazards or other natural hazards so that was just a, a comment also cool thanks tom that's a good point um okay so we'll move on now um we had another question come through and it's probably for you again tom um can the beaches be reseeded with sand to protect their use uh, as an ongoing asset for as long as possible Yeah, so I think you're referring to a sort of beach nourishment in this case. Um, it is, yeah, it's one of those options that's in that catalogue that the coastal panel was sort of asked to consider. So there's probably two parts to this question is, one, is it a reasonable option to um, provide protection to the landward area? So is beach nourishment a good way to essentially provide a sort of buffer 
um, to coastal processes and protect the landward area. Um, Pudo was probably one of those locations where, you know, could you consider that, but really difficult to find a suitable sand source and it can be quite environmentally damaging. Obviously, there has been some nourishment in parts of Whakaro Port in the past, I think. Um, is it Sandy Bay, over near Governor's Bay, um, has had some of that nourishment to provide sort of, so the recreational component is probably the other component which maybe you're talking about, which isn't necessarily to provide protection to the inland area, but to nourish these little sandy pocket beaches for their sort of recreational benefit. So, um, yeah, it's certainly an idea that could be considered, and yeah, thanks for the for the comment on that. Cool, oh, thanks, Tom. Um, and we've now got a question that is more around the coastal panel. So I'm going to get Jane to jump in for this one. Um, how many people on the coastal panel are from Teddington um, or Chatteris Bay? Thanks, Anne. Uh, we have 13 members of the coastal panel and two, by my account, either live in Teddington or we used to live in Teddington and have a long association with Teddington. Um, the way you might be interested to know how we how we found the coastal panel members, we uh, solicited interest from the community through an um, expressions of interest process, and people were able to put their names forward. Um, I think we received around about a um, couple of dozen um, people who put their names forward. I don't believe any of them were actually from Charteris Bay, unfortunately. Um, and so what we did was we looked at the mix of names and um, the, particularly where they were living. So we did put a bit of a focus on trying to get geographic distribution of the coastal panel across the whole of Littleton Harbour, Whakaropo and Port Levy, Kokorarata. Um, and so we we tried to get as much uh, geographic variation as we could, um, as well as looking at um, some of the factors Ruby talked about before. For example, we do want to have uh, young people on our coastal panel um, and we're looking at a mix and range of, of groups. Thanks for that question. Thanks, Jane. Um, it looks like we might have the last question of the evening. Um, David has asked, um, the head-to-head -head walkway was mentioned. Um, how does this fit into the whole picture? Cool. Yeah, I'll take this one. So, yeah, probably two parts. So, first, our Coastal Hazards Adaptation Planning Team at Council, you know, is responsible for giving advice to our parks team and then by effect through to things like the head-to-head -head, um, working party around the appropriateness of existing and future locations for, for example, access track or head-to-head -head walking route. Um, and then more specifically in a place like Charteris Bay, where I appreciate that there is a, you know, a long-standing history of um, sort of interest and dispute around um, preferred routes and whatnot. I would suggest that I think it would be fair to say that if there was a choice through this process to look at um, retaining the existing um, road route along that shorefront, um, that that would absolutely need to require um, bolstering of the existing defences, so essentially lifting um, the road in, in the long term and potentially additional protection. And through a sort of programme of work like that, I do think, and Andrew can perhaps touch on this, it's probably likely that for all sorts of sort of safety reasons and whatnot that the carriageway might need to be widened and through that there might be opportunities for other sort of co-benefits around um, public access that could relate to things like the head-to-head -head walking route. But um, yeah, so it's sort of seen as a not sort of core um, target or focus of our process, which is more around risk reduction um, and community resilience, but um, is, is more of a sort of co-benefit that could be explored through um, design um, as the options sort of evolve in time. But yeah, I think Andrew's got a, a comment, so I'll pass to him. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, we're well aware of the limitations of that particular section of Marine Drive around those um, around those two twin bends and and also of that informal usage, which is um, which has been occurring. Um, it, it, it is significant works to to put in um, widening uh, both of the carriageway and also for for pedestrians and cyclists and and ideally that would be done as part of a, a, a far larger capital works job such as um, you know, rebuilding a seawall or, um, or 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 coastal protection works and things like that so yeah I I, I would be um, very confident that um, pedestrian and cycle um, facilities would be part of any any um, considerations um, to do with rebuilding 
um, that particular section of road. Uh, the, the speed limit has been reduced in recent years, and, and I think that's that's sort of also helped with those um, pedestrian movements through there. But yeah, we certainly acknowledge it's um, there, there is limitations with that particular section. Great, thanks so much for, for that answer, Tom and Andrew. Um, so that uh, brings us to the ends of the questions for tonight. Um, thanks everyone for your um, your questions. It's been really great to um, to answer those for you. Um, and like I said before, please keep sending them through to us um, via email if you've got any further things that you'd like us to clarify before you put in your feedback. Um, it's really important um, that we get your feedback on whether the coastal panel is on the right track with these draft adaptation pathways. Um, we want to make sure that the you know the, the community has a, an opportunity to feed into these. So please do jump online and let us know what you think. Um, so you can go to letstalk.ccc.govt.nz um, and tell us what you think about these. We'll have this open until the 10th of December. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for joining us for tonight's presentation um, and for taking the time out of your busy lives to ch jump online and, and listen to us uh, talk about this stuff. Um, if you've got any feedback about the session or you've got any more questions, then, then please get in touch with us. The details are on the um, slide in front of you now, so you can email us or you can give me a call. Um, We'll be in touch over the coming days um, with any further answers to your questions um, and links to watch this session online. You may also be interested in coming along to our last webinar. Um, so our last one in this series will be next week on Tuesday the 21st of November and that'll be on Pudo and Kokorarata. So you can register online the same way you did for tonight at letstalk.ccc.govt.nz. Thanks again from myself and all of the team. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Tēnā koutou katoa.